exploring innovations in clinical technology and care delivery. I'm Sarah Bender with Perfect Serve, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, let's review the webinar platform. In the middle of your browser, you'll see a box containing today's slides. These will advance automatically through the presentation. To the right of the slides, you'll see a Q&A box to submit a question at any time. Your questions are going to be addressed during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. Underneath that Q&A box, you'll see a Twitter feed with highlights from today's presentation. We encourage you to tweet commentary you find interesting using hashtag PSWebcast. Finally, in the lower left-hand corner, you'll find a resource list with helpful resources, including a copy of today's presentation. Our webinar is being recorded. As an audience member, you are in listen-only mode, so make use of that Q&A box to communicate with our speakers today. And finally, at the conclusion of the webinar, we ask that you complete a short survey and tell us what you thought of today's event. At PerfectServe, we provide healthcare's only comprehensive and secure communications and collaboration platform, used in more than 200 hospitals and 25,000 practices and post-acute providers. Our cloud-based technology combines secure messaging with dynamic intelligent routing to help you reach the right person at the right time for any clinical situation. This webinar series is part of our ongoing promise to drive meaningful improvement in care delivery processes. So thank you all for joining us. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Andrea Martin as today's speaker. Andrea is a consultant with the advisory board and contributes to the Healthcare Advisory Board's Community Hospital Initiative. She's one of the leading researchers for the Community Hospital Quarterly Newsletter which provides strategic research to smaller organizations, independent hospitals, and rural facilities. Prior to joining Advisory Board, Andrea was a practicing physical therapist in Northern Virginia. She received her Doctorate of Physical Therapy from Duke University and a Master of Public Health from the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. So Andrea, thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today to discuss the new innovation agenda. You know, there's been a lot happening in the healthcare industry across the past two years. We've seen policy changes, mega mergers, new competitors entering our market. But what I think hasn't gotten quite as much press is the new developments in clinical technologies that are starting to enter our field that have the potential to completely change healthcare delivery. So today, I want to provide insight on some of those technologies. Here's how we're going to spend our time today. We'll start by looking at how healthcare innovation has evolved over the past decade. Next, we'll look at a curated set of technologies that we believe has great potential to transform healthcare delivery. We'll talk about our initial thoughts and business implications for providers. And finally, we'll wrap up today by placing innovation strategy into the larger context of organizational priorities. So flash back to 10 years ago. Some of you who uh, have worked with the advisory board may remember that we had an innovation center back then. Um, to providers at that time, innovation largely meant technology assessment and service line planning. The number one question that we were asked at the advisory board was about CT scanners. So a 64 slice was better than, um, was the difference between being ahead of the curve or behind the curve. And that's what the innovation center meant back then. Well, innovation means something totally different at hospitals and health systems now. About two thirds of provider bandwidth is going into innovation today is actually for delivery system innovation and process innovation. And, you know, the prevalence of acute care hospitals and health systems having some kind of formal innovation center is striking. By the end of 2018, it's estimated that about three quarters of hospitals will have some kind of innovation center that's up and running, either at the hospital itself or I would guess somewhere in their health system. 
That's remarkable. So today, I want to keep our focus to clinical technology. We have a lot of information at Advisory Board on process information and delivery system innovation. Uh, you can see some of those focus areas on the left side of your screen. I'm happy to follow up with some of those resources. Today, I want to focus on the future and a little bit of a different viewpoint on innovation. So what's coming down the pike and what should we be tracking in healthcare? The answer to that question is there's a lot of incredible clinical technologies that are either already here or in development, um, or realistically both. What you see on this slide here are vectors of innovation. They have many applications, some which already may be practiced in healthcare today. And yet, each of these many vectors, think genetic screening, robotics, artificial intelligence, precision medicine, bioelectronics, and so on, is generating its own pipeline of additional technologies. And each of those has its own distinct business case. And those business cases are a lot more complex than the making of a pro forma for the new type of CT scanner that we were working with 10 years ago. Starting at the top left and going clockwise, let's walk through some of those business challenges of the pipeline innovation. Many of these innovations are IT related and they're developed by non-healthcare entities, IT giants as well as a crop of venture capital backed startups. The ones most appealing to consumers can be difficult to shoehorn into provider economics and our healthcare regulatory frameworks. Many new clinical products in the pipeline apply to narrow markets, which is forcing the prices up and raising a pretty big question of coverage and consumer affordability. Then there's traditional service line planning that's probably not capturing the full scope of today's innovation vectors. Which, trend, which tend to cut across multiple service lines. And then finally, there's demand destruction. Well, this is more of a longstanding problem. You know, we've seen pharmaceuticals in general that have taken out chunks of our procedural businesses. But I think some of the innovations we're gonna be looking at today have that effect times a thousand. It can be hard to detect the opportunity as well as the threat early enough to adapt to some of these. And while this is all going on, at the bottom of the slide, our own economics are up in the air. We need to figure out when, where, and to what degree we should invest in changes if we were to keep our business in the black during these transitional periods. Our research team spent the better half of 2017 sorting through the innovation pipeline. And what we found was not just about consumerism, convenience, digital health, or access. The most important themes we found were personalization, customized care, precision medicine, and cutting edge clinical innovation. Getting the right care to the right person all the way down to the molecular level in some cases. So with that in mind, what we're going to do today is pull out the innovation vectors that follow these themes and walk you through the pipeline. Before we start, I want to say three critical disclaimers. First, these are not best practices. They're important themes and trends with examples to show like what, or even um, thinking about uh, whether the applications will pan out. We're not endorsing any of these particular applications or companies. Second, this is not an in-depth scientific explanation. If you have detailed questions about how these technologies work, I'm happy to, to discuss that offline. Um, but today is more of a high-level overview. And finally, there are going to be a lot of next-level business questions to tackle, reimbursement issues, impact on cost per case, um, the ways in which we might secure consumer or payer steerage. Um, that's going to be our next goal. Because today, just touring these themes is going to take our 60 minutes. So let's go through the clinical technology innovation landscape, roughly following a patient's journey through the healthcare system. We'll start with new sources of data for diagnosing risks. Then we'll look at the process 
the, uh, the, how we can process the wave of in more information from diagnostics and from everywhere else in healthcare to make the best treatment decisions. Finally, treatments will go through treatments that improve the precision and customization of care delivery. There is a ton of innovation happening in clinical treatments today, and these new treatments are not only really fascinating, but very transformative to your business. At each step of the way, we're going to pause and share very early thoughts on implications for business. We're going to start with detecting new indicators of disease. There's a lot of in inventions allowing us to prove our diagnostic capabilities from new data inputs into our system. Let's start with where we stand today. So advances in research and technology have enabled great strides in our diagnostic capabilities over the past century. We've gone from taking a two-dimensional picture to now creating a three-dimensional model of a beating heart. We now have over 10,000 different conditions that a physician can diagnose. You know, better diagnostics means fewer complications and better outcomes. That said, we can never be satisfied with the state of the art in diagnostics. Many diseases are still detected, are not still detected early enough to treat effectively. There are still 80% of cancer cases that are detected in the final third of the disease with, that are fatal. We also have a large category of diagnostics that are toxic for patients. I've seen a study that estimated that CT scans across a single year could generate 29,000 future cancer case, cases, meaning that the cancer in those patients was caused by having a CT scan earlier in life. In the never-ending quest for better diagnostics, there's two main vectors of real groundbreaking transformation here. If we can get our hands on more molecular and polygenic data, we can now accurately detect a disease risk earlier. That means either before it's developed or once it's developed before it's symptomatic. When we're armed with earlier warning, we can move to real-time management. So collecting data from patients with developed diseases and integrating it into clinical workflow to detect ex escalations and intervene right away. So our ability to understand and sequence the human genome set a foundation for precision medicine. We can now use an individual's genomic data to identify a patient's risk for developing certain diseases and to also guide treatment decisions by clinicians. The human genome product was completed over a decade ago. At that time, it cost over a million dollars to sequence one gene. Since then, Two factors have allowed gene sequencing to, tr to transition uh, closer to mainstream. The first is the cost. If you look at the graph on the bottom right-hand side of the slide, over the past decade and a half, technology has enabled the cost of sequencing an individual's genome to plummet. The second is research. You know, we can now identify more actionable treatments to match with gene mutations, which continues to progress as we speak. Together, the lower cost plus those actionable insights are going to pave the way for a broad, genetic, broad uptake of genetic screening. That means that someday soon, health systems could begin to gather baseline information on more of their primary care patients, linking the detection of risk systematically into ongoing management and treatment. A handful of systems are already leading the way on integrating broad genomic testing into primary care. The two keys, making it affordable to, to the patient and actionable. Testing for things that we know how to handle and appropriate clinical next steps. Take a look at what's happening here at North, North Shore. North Shore Medical Group is on the front line for the genomic program at the system. PCPs email patients an optional questionnaire on family health and history. They have an algorithm that then identifies candidates who would benefit from further genetic screening. 
At that time, the PCP sends the patient screening referrals to make sure that they receive any recommended follow-up. The consumer-facing price of the screening varies based on the number of gene sequence in the patient's insurance coverage. You know, some plans today do reimburse if the patient has a detectable risk for genetic disease, um, at which point it's just a matter of the patient's coinsurance or copay. Um, but regardless of coverage, remember I said that the price of gen genomic screening has really gone down. The maximum cost for a patient to pay out of pocket is capped at $500 by the lab that's offering these tests. We'll go over that a little bit more in a moment. North Shore's program is only six months old and it has had impressive momentum. Over 9,000 patients have completed the online questionnaire and of that subset, um, 15% turned out to have actual risks that called for an additional clinical action. This worked out to be a couple hundred patients for, which act for whom actionable risks were detected. You know, I think the most interesting thing here um, from a growth perspective for health systems is how receptive patients are to the service. According to a survey that North Shore uh, conducted, over a third of current primary care patients reported that they were willing to change their primary care physician to have access to this genetic screening program. So in North Shore's case, the system partnered with Invite, which is a commercial laboratory in San Francisco. Remember, the advisory board is not endorsing this company. I just want to share with you the example of a kind of agreement uh, that we think is interesting. After a patient receives a genetic screen at North Shore, Invite sequences the DNA for up to 139 health conditions that meet the bar of having actionable follow-up interventions. The lab does not report mutations for genes that we can't treat at this time um, because there isn't necessarily actionable follow-ups that's not reported to the patient. The team at Invite interprets the results and reports actionable findings, including evidence-based guidelines for the next steps and refers the patients to a genetic counselor. The question of next steps really tees up a critical health question for health systems. Are these genetic screen, as these genetic screens find risks, how can we respond with both preventative management and increased surveillance? So let's say you complete a genetic screen for the patient and find out that they are very high risk for cancer. The, net, the high risk genetic screen does not mean that the patient has cancer. Now you need ways to continually check if or when cancer actually develops with as little as invasiveness as possible. Q, liquid biopsies. These detect disease DNA floating in a person's blood. One of the most promising diagnostic indica indicators, I think, in the pipeline today. Here's an example on the slide, GRAIL. GRAIL is a Silicon Valley biotech startup whose tests can detect cancer DNA in a patient's bloodstream. They use gene sequencing to determine the specific genes that are causing the cancer mutation and guide treatment. GRAIL has about, well, over $1.1 billion in funding across just 2017 alone. It has the most venture capital out of any clinical technology in the market last year. You can see why here. Three quarters of patients that were tested received actionable treatment interventions. GRAIL is currently in clinical trials across the country, and if this is improved for the market, it's going to be transformative for oncology programs. When we step back and look at implications for hospitals and health systems, there are still immature business cases related to some of these um, molecular testing. Um, but that being said, uh, there's a lot in the pipeline that could happen um, that would change our business models and how we refer patients throughout our systems today. Well, welcome to the Internet of Things, our second uh, innovation vector that we're going to go over. If you're not familiar with this term, it refers to how we are now surrounded by everyday objects that constantly send and receive data. It seems that there are at least hypothetical consumer demands for health and wellness devices of every kind, 
with more developments to come across the next decade. Talk about digital overload. Look at the screen. On the bottom of the list on the right side, it does say implantable sensors. I know there's probably some people that are reading that and thinking, like what? Well, here you go. On the left-hand side of the screen, there's a glucose monitoring sensor. Can you imagine instant monitoring of a patient's blood glucose from a sensor placed under the skin? All you have to do is wave a wand over the sensor and the glucose level will appear. Or how about a smart tattoo that changes colors when your sodium levels are too high? I'm distracted by the design question. You know, what should these body chemistry sensing tattoos look like? But I'm going to say, lay it aside and let's tackle some of the more important questions, which is, how do all these patient data sources evolve they will continue to multiply, and what we do, what we need to do is figure out the biggest opportunities for the health system. In the landscape of futuristic patient data stuff, where can we pick out the most important vectors of innovation for us to focus on? The most important principle for identifying data from outside of a hospital's four walls is that it can be used to trigger a different type of clinical care. This often means incorporating patient-generated data into our ongoing clinical workflows. One of the examples that I wanted to share was a high-acuity, high-stakes example from Children's Mercy. Babies with hypoplastic left heart syndrome that need a series of surgeries after birth are extremely fragile between them. After discharge and between surgeries, it's currently typical for parents to record a lot of data on the babies and share with their providers maybe once a week. But at Children's Mercy, their parents are given monitoring devices. The parents use the devices and input data, including qualitative observations, onto an app, which then pushes the information to the, the, to the care team at Children's Mercy. The team can review the status at any time and send an alert if anything urgent happens. Hypoplastic left heart syndrome is a serious condition in which outcomes are often bad. No baby with this disease under Children's Mercy Care has died since the CHAMP program was adopted in 2014. Here's a quote from one of their clinicians. If we follow 30 kids a year, that's a whole kindergarten class that was saved, and that's crazy. We didn't really know what we didn't know before, and we didn't realize that we were missing trends due to only getting numbers once a week. Of course, it's actually really complicated to actually integrate data from any digital health device into real-time care plan within a health system. Children's Mercy did a lot of work behind the, behind the scenes with Microsoft to build a technology and cloud platform that allowed real-time monitoring. But, you know, I think with any source of potential data, we have to actually think about how to integrate this into real-time clinical workflow. And that tees up the question of a platform that could do such a thing. Let's look at an example of a platform on the next slide. This example, ZELF, allows clinicians to integrate data into the EMR for actual clinical outcomes. ZELF was incubated at Providence Health and Services and is in use there and at UPMC. It is compatible with a ton of digital health vendors and allows clinicians to even prescribe specific apps or monitoring devices based on the patient's medical record. When a patient prescribes an app, when a clinician prescribes a patient an app, patients receive an email, and the majority of patients open the email from the Zelf platform. About half of those actually follow through on the recommendation of the digital prescription. The really neat aspect of Zelf is that clinicians are able to monitor patients' data in real time, which is directly implanted into the EMR. Providence is using ZELF right now to monitor over 20,000 patients through their CPAP devices. They check on actual use and ongoing effectiveness of these devices to treat sleep apnea. Over 20,000 patients. Starting to really talk about some scale. So implications for the real-time data from the Internet of Things. 
beyond the fact that real-time patient data is really cool. You know, there's a massive pro proliferation of digital health devices and huge venture capital flowing into this space. We can't get distracted. There's a lot of operational workflow in which we're going to have to get the data and clinicians acting on it is a lot of work. So we need to pick out the noise from the sources of data that are actually going to prompt a meaningful change in clin clinical management with measurable impact on patient outcomes. Let's take a step back to orient us. In the world of top innovations, we're, we've just taken a look at the most important themes in evolving diagnostics, the richness of data that we can someday get from a broad variety of sources. As a consequence of those new data inputs, inputs, in the future, we're going to be more overloaded with data than we already are today. The good news on this front is that the next critical innovation vector for us to examine is all about improving the capability to tap into that value of information with actually less effort than expended today. Some data to probably reinforce what you already know. The amount of information washing into our system is more than we can handle. Depending on the study, clinicians reportedly spend as much time on, quote, desktop medicine as they do on actual patient care. Meanwhile, the amount of raw data that is produced from one small blood sample from GRAIL, the blood, cancer blood test we talked about a moment ago, is equal to about 500 hours of movies. We cannot make sense of all this information at regular human, quote, read and analyze pace. Enter artificial intelligence. Notice we put some shorthand definitions on this slide so we don't get lost in the technical jargon. Artificial intelligence is uh, an, an umbrella concept. Machine learning and natural language processing are under the umbrella of artificial intelligence. Machine learning is more a set of algorithms that can become smarter by making connections on their own. Natural language processing, which I'm going to come back to in a minute in more detail, is machines interpreting synthesizing, and acting on qualitative information, more words and not data. Take a look at the market size for AI applications in healthcare on the right. Sure, 6.6 .6 billion in 2021 is a big market, but what's really stunning here is the growth. The amount of data we have flooding into healthcare is what's spurring that giant market opportunity. Let's start with how it could boost staff to top of license care by streamlining care for low acuity conditions. BrightMD Interact is an interactive software program that integrates into a virtual visit platform, and it uses AI to help it learn and refine the quality of its answers as it goes along. A lot of health systems are using BrightMD, Adventist Health, Greenville Health System, Rush University Medical System, they're all using this technology. What happens is when a patient logs in for a virtual visit, instead of a clinician having a live visit, a white label interface powered by BrightMD interviews the patient. It asks it a lot of diagnostic questions. And the interview takes about 15 minutes of patient AI time to do this. At this time, there is no clinician in the picture. Then, it synthesizes that information and provides it to human clinicians with a recommended diagnose, diagnosis and treatment. The clinician is able to review the information and propose treatment plan and either can accept it or reject it. That clinician review time typically takes about two minutes instead of the average 15 minutes for a live virtual visit. BrightMD estimates about 10% of time that it can't come up with a diagnosis. If that happens, or if the clinician doesn't like the look of what BrightMD came up with on its own, the clinician prompts the patient to schedule an actual office visit. If that happens, the patient or insurance is not charged for the virtual visit. The low, ap low acuity application makes sense. As a goal, it's good for boosting clinicians to top of license 
And it works great for patients, too. Thinking about something like my preschooler has pink eye will come to a case that leaps to mind as a parent. But AI can also be leveraged as a higher acuity application, too. There are several intriguing examples to choose from when it comes to AI's potential to assist in the diagnosis of complex conditions. My personal favorite is Stanford's platform to analyze clinical images of the skin. It can recognize over 2,000 types of skin diseases. Stanford's platform is a conventional neural network, and it has the accuracy at recognizing melanoma as a control group of 21 dermatologists. Now, there's some obvious challenges to using AI in medicine, but hold that thought for a minute because I want to show you one more potentially transformative use of AI before we step back and critically assess all of this. I'm talking about natural language processing. NLP is an extremely important application for, of AI for processing written language. In a world where the volume of clinical information, not just the data, but the words, is exploding, NLP holds out hope that almost instantaneously can analyze massive amounts of written language and form conclusions. It's estimated that IBM Watson can process millions of documents in a matter of seconds. I want to show you a couple instances. One, for cutting through the noise in a medical record to make individuals more efficient, and also keeping evidence-based standards up to date. It's not unusual for clinicians to be faced with wading through long patient histories on a short time frame. For example, when a patient shows up at the ED, NLP could provide a critical assist. MedStar has used NLP to develop a solution called Dictation Lens. It takes keywords related to the patient's presenting issue and reads through the unstructured free text in the patient history. It flags the pieces that are most likely to be relevant in the case. It's a huge efficiency boost for clinicians, and you can imagine the clinical gains from gaining, getting faster insight in an emergency visit. Well, this is where I want to stop and take a moment to say that I'm sure a lot of people will feel this way, and we agree with you, um, and probably many of your physicians at this case, that we might need to tap the brakes on AI. Here's a story at Mount Sinai on the screen where um, they create, Mount Sinai created an AI platform called Deep Patient that was able to make connections across um, patient histories and make diagnosis, diagnosis recommendations. The good news was that the program was completely accurate and it predicted the onset of complex conditions like schizophrenia. Bad news, the program couldn't explain how it was making those predictions. So we need to unlock the potential of AI, but we also need to learn a little bit more about its potential. You know, there's some clear win-win gains in efficiency, um, but we need to understand and be able to assess everything that AI is telling us. I'm going to quickly um, uh, recap these implications, but I want to move on to be able to highlight our next section of innovations. So to be clear with AI, um, None of the technology I mentioned is replacing, replacing clinicians with computers. It's more about offloading some of the tasks that have become unsustainable um, and to be able to um, re reduce the burden or at some times um, improve the quality of, of going through some of this data with, with clinicians and patient visits. It's completely reasonable for physicians and others to have concern about safety and the accuracy of these platforms, and I think that's something we'll need to address as we move forward with AI and healthcare. All right, let's review our progress. We've looked at innovation vectors in both generating and processing the riches of clinical innovation, and also about processing that, the, the information that we get from data. In this last section, I want to actually tackle interventions. Heads up, this section is going to get even more futuristic. There are some incredible and at least potential out developments out there that we want you to be aware of. 
no question that history to date is full of incredible leaps in forward in healthcare interventions. That said, just as we can never be effective enough in our early diagnostics, we will never exhaust our potential to treat interventions. When you look at the next crop of clinical interventions, what you see is a strong trend of treatments that are more precise, meaning that they're more effective or less toxic, and or ideally both. So we're going to walk through four vectors of innovation, each with its own clinical and economic transportation potential. Let's start with molecular and gene therapy. Our focus today on molecular and gene therapies is that they target specific molecules and genes at a much greater precision and customization than most conventional treatments today. Their economics in a nutshell consist of being expensive to develop, and they apply to very narrow niche markets, and thus they are astro astronomically expensive. There's a tremendous market for these types of treatments in the pipeline, and it's full of additional applications under testing today. With the data at the top of this slide, I'm trying to convey the size of spending, even today, on specialty pharmaceuticals, many of which are the molecular therapies we'll discuss. Specialty drugs accounted for 36% of all drug spending in 2015 and 70% of spending growth for, from five years previously. If you look at the bottom of the slide, you'll get a sense of how rapid the pace of development is. The two statistics on the right start to paint the picture for gene therapies. Over 500 are in tri trial phases today, over eight, 180 of which are CAR-T, which we're about to talk about. You probably may have seen the news over the um, second ever CAR-T therapy, which was recently approved by the FDA. Just to make sure we have all the basic concepts, when we say pre precision in drugs, we're talking about two basic mechanisms. One is molecular therapeutics that refer to drugs that target a very specific cell pathway in the body. The second is gene therapies that correct gene mutations within cells. Focusing on molecular and gene therapies is the critical point that can drastically increase precision. So let's look at the cutting edge of molecular therapies first. So what I have on the screen here is CAR-T. Um, at the end of last summer, the FDA issued a historic ruling and approved the first gene therapy in the U.S. And then after we finished this research, it immediately it, uh, it approved a, a second. The first approved therapy is uh, Kimria, which treats a certain pediatric patient with um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. To administer Kimria, a, a physician removes some of the patient's white blood cells, which should have been recognizing and eliminating the cancer, but haven't. Those cells are sent to a manufacturing facility in New Jersey um, and re-engineered to destruct, destruct and destroy cancer. They're then sent back and administered to the patient. It looks like the approval of this drug could be the turning point for CAR-T therapies like this. Remember, there are 180 more of these in the pipeline. I mentioned this earlier, but these drugs have an extremely narrow market with high R&D costs, and they've added up to some very expensive precision drugs. Kimria is $475,000 a dose. The developer says that they are still working with payers to fully ensure they understand the value of this therapy to provide drug co coverage to patients accordingly, but of course, insurance coverage varies. Medicaid has said that it will only cover Kimria if the treatment is successful and the child's cancer enters remission. Otherwise, um, the patient is, does not have to pay and the developer is at risk for the cost. This is a sign of our times as pharma companies began to experiment with value-based reimbursement arrangements for these expensive drugs. It's possible that 
CRISPR, which is another form of gene therapy, will be able to help with the cost problem in gene editing. CRISPR has gotten a lot of press lately with the promise to cure some of the single gene mutations, such as cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia, as shown on the right-hand side of the screen. That would be obviously transformative for this industry. But what if we could cure these diseases for $30? That's the co estimated cost to edit one gene using CRISPR. CRISPR is still a couple years out from entering our industry, but a horde of researchers and biotech companies are still pushing it along. I'm going to skip forward so we have time to review some of our last vectors of innovation. Vector six, engineered organ replacements. Right now, we are falling short of meeting our transplant demands by over 80,000 transplants per year. We have not found a way to produce a supply of healthy organs ready for patients that need transplants. There's two emerging solutions to that question. The first is xenotransplants, using organs transplanted from animals. Stay with me there. The second is using stem cell therapies to regrow human cells into new healthy tissue. That's the ideal, of course. But can we get past the barriers? We'll look in just a minute. So hear me out here. I'm just going to spend a minute on xenotransplantation. But we have already started using pig valves in cardiac surgery. There's a lot of other pig organs that are the right size and very similar to humans. And one company is already working to genetically alter pig organs for human use. They're using CRISPR, in fact. There's a lot of barriers we'll have to get over, and this could be more than two years away, as the company estimates here on this slide, but I think it's something to follow. Clearly, a better solution to addressing the transplant demand would be to be able to repair an individual's own organs using their patient's own cells. This is an example, Biocardia at the University of Wisconsin, that's developed a therapy called CardiAmp. It does exactly that. It treats damaged cardiac cells from heart diseases. Clinicians remove stem cells from a patient's pelvic bone, they process the cells, and they inject it back into the patient's heart, and that triggers more growth of the cardiac tissue. Well, clearly the implications here, this is still a couple years out from entering our market, but you know, I think that the um, compared to some of the other vectors we've gone over here, that these organ transplants are relatively straightforward opportunities for hospitals and health systems. There's huge clinical benefits, there's a larger market, and it's really within providers' wheelhouse. Our, innovation, our seventh vector of innovation, 3D printer-enabled surgeries. The main rate limiter on the custom implant market today is cost. Custom orthotics, prosthetics, and implants are extremely expensive and very few patients have access to them. But it's reasonable to imagine that 3D printing is going to transform our procedural care business. And looking at some of the uses on, on the right-hand side of the slide of 3D printing, the 3D printing process um, is going to, is expected to boom in the, mar in the market in the next couple of years to the point that one projection stated that every, one out of every 10 people will have a 3D printed object in their body in the next two years. Look around the room where you are right now. Are there 10 people? A fair number of health systems are already using 3D printers today. 3D printers can be used to replicate a patient's exact anatomical makeup and use the, th the model before completing a surgery on a real patient. That's the story of what's happening at Mayo, in which surgeons were able to remove a tumor by practicing this way, whereas without the model, they probably would have had to amputate a child's lower extremity. Our 3D ca ca printing capabilities are advancing every year. We can now print more materials than ever um, on 3D printing printers, and hospitals and health systems are starting to invest more in these printers. I want to get to our last innovation today, our vector of innovation. This is bioelectronic device implants. Bioelectronics are the most futuristic innovation profile today. 
and they have potentially the largest benefit um, for hospitals and health systems. As the clinical treatments I showed you um, this afternoon are aimed towards treating some component of the cells in your body, bioelectronics treat the peripheral nervous system rather than treating the cells itself. The concept behind bioelectronics involves implanting a small computer chip size device near a nerve that can then control cells and organs that the nerve shows downstream of the body. Look at this example with asthma. A patient is struggling to breathe because of a stimulus in the environment. The bioelectronic chip can turn on an electric signal in the nerve that controls the lungs and causes the airways to dilate. At this point, the patient is able to breathe easily. So I think, again, this is probably far superior than some of our pharmaceutical treatments today because it can proactively treat and control chronic diseases. And they don't necessarily come with all the side effects that our pharmaceuticals have. You might ask how real are these technologies? Well, they're still in the conceptual phase, but again, researchers are pushing it along. Um, here's an example, a real promising example is Galvani Bioelectronics. Galvani is a joint venture between Alphabet and GSK, both of which are pumping money into R&D bio for bioelectronic solutions that cure chronic diseases. Those chronic diseases make up a good portion of our book of business today. So keep an eye on this, Paul. I think it's one that we'll want to follow for the future. So a reality check here with bioelectronics. They're not yet ready for prime time, and we're going to need to answer some major questions before we can bring these to bedside. But imagine what our hospitals and health systems and healthcare system would look like if we were able to proactively treat chronic diseases. It would be just awesome. The market is huge, very large, um, and we're going to have to go back to the drawing board on chronic disease management that we use today. So we've made it. Final thoughts before we go our separate ways. The new innovation agenda. The goal today was to take you on a tour of innovation vectors that we think have the greatest transform transformative potential in healthcare today. We've looked at new indicators of disease, processing and leveraging all the new information that's flooding into our health systems, and taking advantage of new breakthrough interve interventions. Going up a level, remember that we can look through the lens of individual technologies and I think it's important to do that, to have fluency with what these things are. There's absolutely innovation and disruption looming in our industry. But armed with that knowledge, we can begin to prepare, be better prepared for our times of uncertainty. So thank you all very much for your attention. I'd now like to open the line up for questions. Thank you, Andrea, for that really visionary presentation today. I want to remind you all that to submit a question, you can use the Q&A box on your screen. I'll read the question that you've submitted to Andrea, and she can answer it for us. As you were talking about innovative technology and specifically offloading some tasks that are unsustainable and improving the quality of going through data, I wanted to remind our audience about PerfectServe. Yeah, PerfectServe incorporates each group's workflow rules, multiple call schedules, roles, patient assignments, and preferences to create algorithms that will connect care team members to the right individual for the given uh, clinical situation. And we analyze those combination of real-time situational variables to ensure that the communication is delivered to the right physician or nurse or other care team member. And this capability eliminates the need to search and struggle to find this information and only to call the wrong person after you've gone through all that time to look for that. So PerfectServe does that automatically for our clients. So Andrea, one of the questions I have for you is, you know, this was so visionary. How can these innovations be leveraged for profitable growth for providers? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think some of the more futuristic ones, that's hard to, to see at this point. I think when we look at some of the, um, the diagnostic um, innovations like genomic screening, um, that has the potential to open up um, providing care to patients that truly need it um, and getting some of those downstream treatments. So, um, you know, really uncovering some of those risks of disease uh, that patients may not have known about really opens the opportunity to, um, you know, form that um, um, uh, that bond between the consumer and the health system um, to then, you know, capture all of the further treatment that's going to happen downstream. Um, you know, some of the um, some of the innovations that are going to be more destructive to our business model. Um, you know, we're going to have to make some big decisions about what providers look like in the future. Um, if there's no longer chronic disease, we might not be housing uh, inpatient beds in a hospital. Uh, that might not be what patients need from us. So, um, you know, looking really futuristic, we might need to change what we offer and what we do um, to be able to serve serve our patients. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Folks, I want to remind you, you can submit a question using the Q&A box. We do have a survey at the end of our session today that we'd like for you to complete as well. Andrew, you touched on this a little bit. What impact will clinical innovations have on provider margins? Uh, another really good question. Um, I think... Um, I think that for some of our, for some of the um, innovations, certainly going to need to be uh, with that growth opportunity, especially with the genomic screening. I think we're going to see um, more revenue opportunities to add to our margins. Um, I think with some of the more expensive innovations, like um, genetic or gene therapies and some of those expensive pharmaceuticals, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of questions about um, um, it. Is this an affordable? Is this affordable for patients? And who is going to pay for those pharmaceuticals? Might not necessarily be a bump in um, in margins for all providers. Um, but again, there's going to need to be some level of um, you know patients are going to want access to the, the that those treatments and um, you know figuring out what your role is in the market. Um, do you maybe offer some of those treatments um, for despite the um, the expense and um, maybe capture the downstream revenue um, do you maybe not uh, do you maybe partner with another facility that does that to try to capture some of that downstream revenue to bump the margins um, you know it's it's not necessarily clear with everything that that is is coming down the pipe today but I think um, you know, I think some of these are going to be a challenge for us because it's not necessarily the same way that that we do business today, and it could have a you know a different effect on our margins that we're used to with providing care. Sure, thank you for that. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity again to thank Andrea Martin for a, a great presentation. It's really helpful to see what research you all come up with and what you see on the horizon, um, whether it's near time or super feels like it's super way off in the future. I know some of those things are probably a little closer than we think. And I do want to thank our audience for joining us. That concludes our webinar for today. Please take a moment to complete our short survey at the end, and I hope you all have a great afternoon.